When I was first diagnosed with cancer, there was a fear that the chemotherapy could possibly make me sterile. So it was suggested that I go to a sperm bank and <clears throat> make a deposit. So who do you think made this suggestion? Was it my doctor? Was it my nurse? My girlfriend? No way. It was actually my mother. So I thought this experience was going to be like something out of a movie. Hot nurse in a sexy uniform, state-of-the-art erotic material, and all that good stuff to really get me in the mood. Well, I couldn't have been more wrong. My mom drives me there, and I get put into this like little tiny room by myself. OK, so it looked like a doctor's office. Imagine this. A chair, a table, no window. I'm like, ah. This is going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to be able to perform my best with all this going on. But I do what I had to do. I handled my business. Ten minutes later, I walk out with my children in a cup. And who's the first person I see? Oh, yeah, it's my mom. Really, like, the first person that I want to see after this special moment. Hey, Ben, how'd it go? <laughs> Whatever. So I take my sample, I hand it to the nurse. A machine analyzes it on the spot. Ben, we have some good news, and we have some bad news. The good news, your sperm count's amazing. Way above average. And I'm like, yeah, I'm 18. Like, uh, it should be. But the bad news is your volume, well, it's a little low. Did you have any issues in there? Did you spill? Wait, what? Did I spill? Well, it was awkward. I was uncomfortable. Gravity's absolutely working against me, but whatever. She goes, OK, Ben, but maybe try to aim down next time. And I'm like, wait, seriously, aim down? So I kind of like turn my head in disappointment. And who's there consoling me? Like I just failed a test or lost a soccer game? Yeah, it's my mom. Oh, honey. I'm sure you'll do better next time. <laughs> when I was 18 years old, I ran into a thief. A thief of time. This thief tried to steal a big part of six years of my life. It tried to steal my identity. In fact, it tried to steal my entire future. The name of the thief is, of course, cancer. In my case, lymphoma, blood cancers in the lymph system. But don't worry, guys. The story's got a happy ending. After six years, I won the battle against cancer, the disease. I'm happy. Thank you. I'm happy. I'm healthy. And I'm cancer-free for almost two years now. But even though I'm well again, and I'm enjoying my life, it's still hard for me to come to grips with my experience, and what it means, and what I should be doing with my life now that I have it back, it has sometimes been harder for me than actually defeating the disease. But you know what? I think that's an issue we all face, whether we're facing a life-threatening illness or not. Oftentimes, we really just want to ignore this challenge, but then life goes a direction we would have not have chosen. Something horrible happens, and the challenge is there, and we can't ignore it. For me, it all started four days before I was supposed to move into college my freshman year. My doctor sits me down and says the words that nobody ever wants to hear. Then I have some terrible news. You have cancer. And that's the moment denial you know, started to settle in with me. But you know what really upset me? It wasn't that I had a disease that could take away my health, my ability to be a father one day, or my own life. It's when my parents sat me down. They looked at me and said, Ben, we're sorry, but there's no way you're going to be able to go to school. You've got to stay home. You've got to let us take care of you. 
until you get better. Now that's the moment the thief arrived. My future was being stolen. All of my friends are embarking on their adventure, and I had to stay home and deal with something that I had never even heard of. I didn't realize it, but denial had already kicked in. I let others carry the burden of my diagnosis. I did what I had to do. Keep your head down, get through it, but don't ever think about it. Even the mirror, which reflected a very sick image, it still wasn't me. The words Ben and cancer were never in the same sentence. But that is how I got through years of chemotherapy and two bone marrow transplants. Of course, there was no way I could deny the pain, the discomfort, the endless hours of chemotherapy, or the numbing exhaustion. But there was one thing that I could deny. I could deny that this giant ax hanging over my head was calling into question everything I thought I knew about myself, who I was, what I thought I wanted, and what I thought was important. As long as I had to physically focus on getting through each day, one day at a time, I could kick that can down the road. And I did just that. But to my surprise, my toughest challenge arrived on April 29th, 2013, almost six years after I was diagnosed with cancer. I'm cruising on the freeway on my way to the gym. My phone rings, and I recognize the number. I knew it was my doctor, but I didn't want to answer it because every single time I picked up the phone, my doctor called. It was bad news, but I knew I had to pick it up. Hello? Ben, it's Dr. Foreman. We just got the results from your, from your PET scan, and great news, you're 100% cancer-free. Go on and live your life. And I couldn't believe it, because like in that moment, I had my life back. I'm rolling down the windows, I'm playing music, I'm like, yes, this is my life, and I have it back. So what did I do? Well, I just went to the gym. So I'm cruising, I'm at the gym, and I'm in this class. So picture this, we're all working out, we're having a good time. The teacher says, wow, everyone just feels great right now. It seems like everyone's just really grateful to be here. And I'm like, yeah, I could probably agree with that. And then a couple minutes later, she goes, does somebody want to yell why they're grateful? <laughs> but I'm like, uh, I'm looking around and like, no one's saying anything. Whatever. Uh, yeah, I'm 100% cancer free as of today. And the class goes crazy and high fives and hugs and I swear it was like, best day of my life. But in that moment, I don't think I realized it, my friend Denial began to desert me too. I realized that I couldn't put off facing the meaning of my experience anymore. My battle with cancer was over, but my journey was just beginning. I no longer had the luxury of putting off the big questions. Even though I was better, Suddenly, I started to hear something that I could never hear before. Tick, talk, tick, talk. I was overwhelmed with the sense that time is running out. And I told myself, hey Ben, if you're gonna do something, you better do it now and you better make it count because the clock is ticking and time is running out. I would tell myself, hey Ben, if you're dating a girl, you better marry her. If you're thinking about moving, well, you better get going. If you're thinking about doing something daring, whether it's starting a nonprofit or becoming an artist, you better get going because the clock is ticking and time is running out. And so it hit me like a ton of bricks that we waste a lot of our time in this precious culture paying attention to something that doesn't even exist. We're bombarded with nonstop propaganda from a world that focuses on getting a million likes rather than finding meaning in real relationships. If we get retweeted by a celebrity, it makes our day. Well, it makes my day too. And we're told that more is better, but nobody points out that if more is better, there can never be enough. When I landed my dream job at a sports network, I should have been on top of the world. The 18-year-old Ben, the pre-cancer Ben, he would have been on top of the world. But at age 24, 
The cancer survivor bend? Eh, that's great. Eh, that's nice. But maybe there are some things in your life that are just more important. Things like friends, things like family, things like making a deep personal connection with other people, like finding meaning in relationships, and purpose in the decisions we make, and just being vulnerable when it matters the most. A hundred years ago, doctors would say that a little suffering, well, it's good for the soul. Why? Well, I think it's because it helps us focus on what's really important. Today, we actually don't think suffering is necessary. And that's something that, well, I've thought a lot about. Growing up, I always wanted to be on a grand stage. I always wanted to be that guy in the spotlight. But I didn't think it'd be because of cancer. And I'm still struggling to come to terms with that. I often think about something that Steve Jobs once said. Another guy who battled cancer for years. And a few years after Jobs was diagnosed with cancer, he said, we can't connect the dots looking forward. We can only connect them looking backwards. Because believing that the dots will connect down the road will give us the confidence to follow our heart, even when it leads us off that well-worn path. You see Jobs, he could hear that clock ticking too. For him, unfortunately, the clock finally ran out. But for all of us, whether you guys can hear it or not, it's still ticking. These days, I'm still struggling to come to terms with why I'm on this stage. I'm still partially denying why I am here. But going through a huge crisis, it teaches you something. We can't always choose the direction our life will take. We have one choice. We can choose how we respond. And I believe it's our best choice to make every single moment matter and be the best person you can be in that moment. Even if pain, exhaustion, or disappointment is tempting you to fall below your own standards for yourself. You know, sometimes it's a good plan to skate along the surface and not pay any attention to the giant pitfalls and dangers and endless negativity in your life. But there, but there comes a time where we need to deny denial and recognize that pain can be our friend too. That loud, ticking clock, it can be our friend. The fact that we won't be here forever is what makes each moment precious. The fact that we're only here for a limited amount of time is what makes each person precious. And the fact that it sometimes takes a scary, traumatic episode to wake us up to these realities is what makes our very own fate precious. Even when life takes a turn, we wish it hadn't taken. It's not about what happens to us. It's about our attitude. If we change our attitude, if we revolutionize our outlook, our action will take care of itself. If we can all come to terms with the fact that it's all just a passing show and nothing matters except this moment, then not only will that moment matter to you, but it'll matter to all of those around you. Well, you may even come to decide, as I did, that if I'm not gonna live forever, I'd like to create something good that survives me. A legacy. Well, maybe a legacy is too grand a word, but we all have the instinct to pass along something of ourselves, whether it's our gene pool, which, remember, mine is frozen somewhere, uh, our identity, our passion, our art, or our, our commitment to a cause larger than ourselves. Because nobody wants to leave this place unloved, unmourned, and without making a difference, as if you had made no more mark than a pebble being tossed into a pool. So here I stand, guys, present, happy, healthy, and smiling. And maybe, just maybe, ready to accept a new bargain with life. So I want to leave you guys with this. We don't have the ability to choose 
the direction our life will go. But we have the power to choose how we respond. I am living proof that it's not what happens to you that matters. It's what you think about it. It's what you choose to do about it. You don't always find your greatest inner strength when the chips are down. Sometimes, like me, you actually find it when the chips are up. But when you find it, I promise that you have that power too. You have the power to focus on what's deep and what's real and what outlasts that ticking clock. You have the power to make every single precious moment matter, not just for you and not just for now, but for all of those around you and for all those times to come. Thank you.